Hello, my name is Samantha Schellenberg and today I'm sitting here with Thomas Curley on video. Um, we are going to spend some time talking about his professional pr production mixing experience and um, dive a bit into his work on Whiplash as well. So thanks so much for joining me uh, here today, Thomas. I'm excited to discuss. How are you? <laughs> Hi, good, thanks. Awesome. <laughs> How about first and foremost, we get started uh, by you telling us a bit about yourself and how you got started in the industry. Sure. Um, well, I've been a production sound mixer for almost 20 years now. Um, I work on feature films and television series, uh, as well as some commercials and other things, but that's the bulk of my work. Um, I, uh, As long as I can remember, I always loved movies, and when I was a sophomore in high school. I found out that we had a filmmaking program, uh, extracurricular thing, and so I started making movies on VHS with my friends, and uh, I found that I liked that a whole lot, and we actually got some awards from local you know, student film competitions and things like that, so um, I... Uh, pursued that further in community college and uh, and then later at uh, film school mm -hmm. um, and I tried initially to get into places like NYU and um, UCLA or USC and things like that and I didn't get in so I ended up going to a state school uh, the State University of Buffalo and uh, it turns out that they had a great avant-garde cinema study program and uh, I learned all kinds of stuff there about film history and theory and composure and um, started uh, trying to get local, you know, little production assistant jobs on local films and really whatever I could find. Um, and then after I graduated, I got a job at a uh, local TV affiliate um, doing broadcast engineering work and I learned a lot about live television there. And that's where I first started doing sound for the news. Um, I would go out on remote trucks and uh, do the live broadcast sound from there and then also in the control room for the anchors and stuff, um, which was a really easy way to get into it because all the hard work was already done. I just had to you know, just push the faders up and down. But I learned a whole lot there about how everything worked and uh, why they do a lot of things they do. And, and then um, in 2001, I was a production assistant on the DreamWorks movie, The Time Machine, uh, with Guy Pierce. And I met my mentor there, uh, who was a sound mixer named David McMillan. And um, I was looking for an on-set career, and I didn't really know exactly what it was, but when I started uh, working with David, I really caught the bug, so to speak. I found that um, sound really fit my personality and my technical skills, and you know, it, it folded into the art side of the filmmaking process. And so, I, I really liked uh, you know all the vibes I was getting from that, and I decided to pursue it full time. Um, at the end of 2001, I moved to Los Angeles, and I've been here ever since. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> I I love that part. I feel like a lot of people can can relate to shooting movies and videos in in high school or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's a lot of fun, and then sometimes you get yourself in some trouble. <laughs> Did you get yourself into some trouble? Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, nothing too bad. While we are focusing on, um, you know, kind of how you got your start with the first question, I, I wanted to ask for the aspiring mixers listening in about the best way you learned um, about mixing early on in your career. Um, was it from a book? Was it from a class? Was it from your mentor? What was the like, most valuable way you learned something early on? Yeah, well, um, I, I had a lot of helpful steps, um, but I didn't learn a whole lot about it in school. Um, that That's something that even to this day, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of schools that actually teach 
film students how to get good sound and you know why it's important. Mm -hmm. um, however, uh, I, I did um, you know get a lot of on-the-job experience, which I think is is really important. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that came through actually doing production assistant work and uh, really sort of taking the effort to go over and observe different crafts, you know, as they're as they're in the middle of it and ask them questions. And um, you know, if if it turns out that sound is the kind of thing that you think you're interested in, then go out and expose yourself to it as much as possible. I think that's really the, the mm -hmm. best thing to do. Um, meeting different people and uh, observing the way that they do the job differently and asking them why um, will get you a whole lot of sort of zen of what is necessary, you know. Um, mm -hmm. You can really drive yourself nuts with the uh, technical side of it and trying to make everything perfect, but um, something I've learned over my career is that, you know, perfection is not necessarily required at every second of every day. It's, it's more of the overall uh, picture that you're trying to make good. The next question I have uh, regarding set actually is probably one of the most annoying issues I've noticed on set is a noisy environment. Um, so how yeah. have you dealt with a challenging location in the past, and do you have any particular stories that come to mind? So, especially out in L.A., there's tons of noise. It's a very active city. <laughs> right. And people like to film on location here a lot, so it's, it's often a, a grab bag of noises that we have to deal with. Um, there are an innumerable amount of sources of, of noise that you can come across on a film set, but um, the, uh, the, the fundamental understanding of the physics of sound is really um, an important thing to learn when you're trying to eliminate offending noises from your environment. Um, however, uh, that, that's a that's a long, boring discussion, and uh, there's a lot of math involved. So, if you really want to dive into that, there's a book called The Master's Handbook of Acoustics, hmm. which uh, will really help uh, you know your brain understand how sound works in in a lot of really uh, you know minute ways. But um, when you're on set. There's a few things that, that you need to remember. First of all, everything you record is going to be edited. So if if an offending noise happens and it's not necessarily over the top of dialogue, then you might be able to edit around it. Um, and that's where something called room tone comes in handy. So if you are on a noisy set, you want to take at least a minute to try and record some silence of whatever that room is so that you can patch that in over noises later and the audience won't know. Um, another thing you can do is, is um, solve the, well a lot of people say we'll fix it in post, but the cheapest and easiest way is to fix it in pre-production. So if you can go to the location ahead of time and sit there quietly for a while, you'll hear the ambient noises that are in that area and if it's things like refrigerators or whatever then you can turn those off but if there's a lot of traffic then maybe you can move to a room where there's less windows or a room that's farther away from the road um, and it, it's all about trying to put as much stuff as much solid matter between you and the offending noises as possible um, so that you can you know block as much of that sound from getting to your microphone as you can. Um, there's a couple other things. The choice of microphone can be very important. If you're in a very uh, bouncy or reverberant room and you have a very wide pattern microphone, you're going to hear a lot more of that reverb than you do if you have a shotgun microphone. Um, and also the amount of distance between the microphone and the source 
is very important. Um, the closer the microphone is to the source, the more present that source is going to sound. The farther away you put it, the more of the room you're going to hear, even if it's in a directional microphone. Um, so that's why things like lavaliers sound so present, um, even in a bad environment, because the microphone is literally right here. Um, and that distance really, you know, helps. <laughs> like you said, it's, it's very technical. It could be a lot of math and it's a lot of good stuff to dive into. Yeah. Well, but, one other thing to remember is that, um, that hard, flat surfaces are going to bounce sound around your room a lot more than soft, plush, curvy surfaces. Mm. So the, the more plush stuff you can put in the room, the less bouncy it's going to sound. Right. Absolutely. Um, and I'm excited to check out the, that book you mentioned as well. That's a good recommendation. It's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> By the time a project gets to its final mix, there's uh, probably been ADR and fully done over the production sound. Um, but how mm -hmm. much of it, how much of the production mix do you think uh, doesn't get re-recorded in post? You know, how much of it do you think stays true till the final? Right. Um, well, ideally, all of it. Um, of course. As far as, as far as whiplash goes, I was told that they only looped uh, six lines from the whole movie, and four of those were because of uh, dialogue changes that they wanted to make after filming, right. um, which is something that ADR is used for a lot, um, as opposed to fixing bad sound. Um, now, there's... Um, it, it's always my goal to get 100% of my recordings used in a movie. It's not realistic for a litany of reasons, um, but the type of production that you're making also can affect this as well. If you're shooting an intimate drama you know, between a, a small amount of cast members in a small controlled you know, environment, then your likelihood of using all of your production recording goes up. But if you're shooting an action-heavy piece where there's things exploding and people running and fighting and um, you know shooting guns all the time and vehicles racing around and all that stuff, then your your likelihood of needing to loop some of that stuff goes up quite a bit. And that's um, you know ideally that's uh, a discussion that you would have with the producers and the directors and camera people and as much as is practical on the set, you want to alleviate these problems. Some of that could be done with on-set recording of wild lines and things like that. But in reality, ADR, even though it's something that costs the producers money and they don't like to use, it's a filmmaking tool just like any other tool. And you know, it can be used well or it can be used poorly. And, um, you know, that's really sort of up to the people that are making financial decisions. Um, and also, if the director has, you know, a, enough wherewithal to plan for things, they, they can, you know, they can use ADR to their favor, um, you know, and to uh, string things along. Or if they know ahead of time that they're not going to need perfect sound for this one particular spot, they can tell us to just get a guide track and, you know, um, it makes things easier and more efficient on set. Um, so it, it's, it's something that, that can be used in a lot of different ways, but um, I, I always try and uh, sort of work the, the expectations out with the producers and directors ahead of time and uh, try and give them what they want. Mm. So yeah, it really depends then. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, um, you know, th there's uh, things that the actors do and the cameras um, that can affect how good we get things on the day. Like if, mm -hmm. if there's a scene where the actor's not wearing a shirt, mm -hmm. then there's pretty much no way we can wire them. Yeah. Um, you know, so, um, you know, there's all kinds of factors that affect us that aren't necessarily directly because of us. So, um, a lot of it is sort of chasing what we're given and trying to make the best out of whatever situation we're in. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And there's certainly times when they won't 
the communication might not be perfect. They might not tell you that, hey, this actor is going to be shirtless today or things like that that are you learn on set. Yeah, yeah. and uh, that, that's not the best way to do things, but it's, it's real life and not everybody is thinking about, uh, oh, that might affect sound. You know, the, um, a, a lot of times they're just as surprised as I am. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, you know, th that's that's the thing. Is like good communication is the most valuable thing in this whole business. Um, the more that, that everybody knows about what you're planning to do ahead of time, the better they're going to be able to make it and more efficient. And you know, that's what we really all want is to mm -hmm. do our best work and go home on time. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that. So. <laughs> Something else I'd love to hear about is your preferred gear setup right now. What microphones you're currently sure. into, what uh, headphones you like, stuff like mm -hmm. that. Um, well, the headphones, I actually uh, first got the headphones that I use from my mentor, which are mm -hmm. sound devices, or, which are Sennheiser HD2 252s. Mm -hmm. um, and those are. Uh, it's an over-the-ear headphone, and they have like a headband that can kind of separate, so if you're whipping your head around, they don't fall off. Um, but it's a uh, it's a very solid uh, product that they've been making for decades now, um, and it's a very flat response uh, headphone. I don't ever wear headphones that have things like bass boost or anything like that. Yeah, no beats. <laughs> I, w I want to hear the recording as true as possible um, <laughs> before I hand it off to anybody. Right. Um, as far as microphones go, um, Sheps is a German brand. It's uh, S C H O E P S. Mm -hmm. um, they uh, they're one of the premier uh, filmmaking microphones in the business. Um, Sennheiser, I would say, is probably the next best um, reputation wise but really they're they're pretty equal um, Sheps makes uh, two main microphones that are that are incredible for filmmaking uh, one is the CMIT which is uh, famously sort of electric blue colored and that's a shotgun microphone and then uh, the um, MK 41 is a uh, shorter microphone with a wider pattern, and we use those a lot of times for close-ups or mm -hmm. uh, plant mics. Mm -hmm. um, now, I also have a set of Sennheiser um, MKH-60 and MKH-50 microphones, mm -hmm. which are also long and short. Um, and the reason I have long and short versions of both is uh, because they, they work better in different environments and different shots and things like that so um sometimes we like to use the the chefs on a close up the 41 on a close up um and sometimes it it just sounds better in a different environment than the 50 or otherwise you know um after you've been doing this for you know a decade or so you get to know these microphones enough that you don't even need to have a conversation with the boom operator they, they will uh, know them just as well as you and and oftentimes change them if they think that they're hearing something poorly and ask you if you agree and and you know 99 times out of 100 I'll say yes because they, they know it just as well as I do but um, those are the boom microphones that I use the most uh, Rode make some pretty good ones, but also you can get some really good used ones off of eBay. Uh, the Sennheiser 416 is uh, an incredible microphone that, they, that is kind of bulletproof. And um, those used to be well over a thousand dollars and you can get them on eBay now for, um, you know, a few hundred to, you know, seven hundred dollars or so depending on the condition they're in um i use for wireless i've been using electrosonics from the start um and i find that they are uh the best 
in terms of build quality, reliability, uh, sonic quality, signal strength. Um, they're they're expensive. They're not the most expensive. There's Zaxcom brand, which are more, and uh, a couple others. But um, Electrosonics has been the industry standard for probably 30 years now. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things where wireless are sort of finicky enough that, um, you know, having something that's reliable is a real lifesaver. And I've, I've trusted Electrosonics my whole career, and, and they've been pretty awesome. Um, the microphones that I put in those are, uh, well, they, um, the Sankin COS-11 is uh, pretty much the industry standard for lavaliers these days. Um, they sound great. They're, you know, resilient. They're very small. They're not the smallest, but they're very small. And... Um, you know, they, they, they have tons of little tricks and options that they come with that you can use to hide them on actors well, and uh, they haven't failed on me. You know, I mean, they, they do break sometimes, mm -hmm. but that's, you know, usually the actor's fault. <laughs> um, there's also uh, uh, Countryman makes a, a microphone called the B6, which is probably the smallest lavalier that money can buy. Um, it's like the the actual capsule on the end of the wire is smaller than a match head, and um, they also have uh, the distinction of being water resistant. So I've actually uh, used those on actors when they go in a river or a lake or um, a dunk tank or whatever crazy shenanigans they get involved in. Um, and they also sound good for being how small they are, which is kind of a a miracle. Um, the uh, the other thing that that I use a whole lot microphone wise that I don't know that people are, are widely informed of is plant mics. And mm -hmm. um, Sankin makes uh, another microphone called the Cub One, which is a, a boundary microphone, um, which means you can set it on a flat surface uh, like a tabletop or the windshield of a car or you know things like that. And it will pick up um, a, a wide area of people, like a car full of people you can get with one microphone on the windshield. And it's very small. It's like a little bit bigger than the footprint of a quarter. And um, something like that, when, when we're filming in cars or things like that, uh, small environments where it's hard to get a boom in or conference room scenes, they rent, you know, or dinner, dinner, uh, table scenes, you know, there, there's always places to hide, uh, one of these next to a teacup or something. And it really makes getting a, like a large crowd of, of people talking a lot easier mm. when, uh, especially when we're shooting like three cameras and, one of them seeing the floor and the ceiling and the other two are zoomed in on close-ups and stuff. You know, there's uh, a lot of times where the boom microphone just doesn't work well. Um, so plant mics are something that, that everybody should uh, have in their kit um, if they're doing this all the time. Um, as far as recording equipment, um, I've been... When I first started, uh, I was using a, a Fostex DAT machine, which is digital audio tape. But uh, after a few years, everybody was looking for hard drive recording. And so I started with a program that's still available. It's a software program uh, called Boom Recorder. And that uses uh, Firewire audio in interface and records on a computer. Um, but then I moved up to uh, the sound devices uh, hard disk recording, and I've uh, been with them ever since. I started with the uh, 744T recorder, and now I own, uh, well, I still own that, but um, I, I now use the uh, 688, which is a 12 channel recorder, mm -hmm. and uh, I've used those for the past four or five years now. Um, and that's been a really solid platform. Um, 
I've only filled up all 12 channels like once or twice. And <laughs> that's, uh, that's on big shows. So, uh, you know, I, I think uh, that's probably where I'm going to stay for a while now. They, uh, they did just release a, a 16 track version and uh, there's other recorders out there now that can record 32 or even 64 tracks and that just seems bananas to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, part, part of my job is to, uh, to make a recording that, you know, is, is um, usable in post-production and if, if you're turning in 64 tracks that, I mean, you're recording a concert at that point. So, or, or, or a stage play or, um, or some kind of reality show. Um, <laughs> certainly markets for those things but that's not the kind of work that I do yeah absolutely um, and let me think so oh there's time code is a very important thing um, for the longest time I used the uh, Deneke smart slates which are those slates that have the, the time code numbers running on them mm. and um, those have been the industry standard for 40 years or so and they work great but there's a new um, spate of uh, time code equipment out these days. Um, Tentacle is one of them. Uh, yes. The Ambient mm -hmm. it, uh, makes uh, another system. Both of them, they, uh, they wirelessly transmit the time code to these little receiver things that you can put on each and every camera that you have, uh, sound recorders. Script supervisors use them sometimes, and uh, it, it's kind of amazing the uh, the rejamming of everything every six seconds means that you can have you know five six cameras and uh, slates and all kinds of things out all day long, and you never once have to worry about them going out of sync with each other. Um, you know, if, if they run out of signal, as soon as they get back into the signal area, they re they check everything to make sure it's good and rejam if if needed. And, um, those kind of things are more or less convenience features nowadays, but they're really handy in in the fast moving TV world. Um, I think. Oh, uh, for headsets for uh, people on set, uh, directors, script supervisors, camera people, and such, I've been using the Comtech system. Uh, since I started, and I think that's pretty ubiquitous. Um, Sennheiser makes an uh, in-ear monitor as well that I, I think a lot of people have had success with. That's um, I think it's more tuned to the music world. But um, and then Lectrosonics also has IFBs that are very robust and, and very high quality. Um, there's probably more out there that I don't know about, but uh, those are the big three. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, KTEC is, is obviously the, the largest manufacturer of boom poles in the world, I think, and they, they do a pretty darn good job of it. Um, there's others out there that are more of a personal preference kind of a thing. Uh, Panamic is one of them, that's mm -hmm. out of France. Um, Loon used to be a boom company. I think they might have gone out of business. I think that was just mm -hmm. one or two people and making them. Um, but if you're, if you're looking for a great boom pole, you can't go wrong with KTEC. And, um, yeah, I think that's about it for you. I, I don't spend a ton of money on cables. Like, I don't buy monster cables or anything that claims to have any, you know, space age technology in their cables because that's usually, uh, you know, malarkey. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, awesome. That's a lot of really fun stuff to look into. I'm, <laughs> I'm excited to dive in yeah. to a lot of that. That's good. And and th those are, uh, you know, those are all high-end, expensive pieces of gear. Of I spent a lot of money on this stuff. And it's not the kind of thing that a beginner should feel that they need to, to be spending $10,000 on, you know, equipment. Um, I would recommend if you're getting started, uh, if you're going to spend money on anything, it's microphones. Yeah. Um, the uh, the cheaper nonlinear recorders these days, like your Zooms and and other things like that, 
are honestly plenty good. If you put great microphones into them and use them correctly, you're going to get a good result. Um, they're a little less forgiving. You know, they don't have all of the tricks that, that the big boy stuff does. They don't have the most amazing electronics, but they do a pretty darn good job. And um, with all of the, you know, post-production magic that they have these days, you can really, you know, put out a really good product without spending a ton of money. Um, it's, it's more about the fundamentals than the equipment. Absolutely. And um, kind of to bounce off of all that, I was wondering if there was mm. any type of hardware that you thought maybe isn't worth putting the money into what might be an overrated piece of gear in your opinion. If you're not making your living off of it, like I, I wouldn't spend, you know, six thousand dollars on a recorder. Um, right, when exactly. You, like you know, like I just said, you can get away with a Zoom uh, yeah. for a few hundred bucks. So I would say start small in the recorder realm. Mm -hmm. um, start small in the wireless realm too, uh, because uh, wireless didn't exist until you know, the early 70s, and even then it was uh, kind of voodoo magic. So um, every movie you've seen that's older than that was done with nothing but boom microphones and plant microphones that were hardwired into a machine. Um, so spending money on wireless early on, I think, is, is probably not a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, you're going you're gonna to learn sound you're going to learn good sound better by using just boom microphones early on. And um, a lot of producers, uh, especially like reality and, uh, you know, corporate people are, are going to be very quick to just say, well, throw a wire on them and, and we'll let them go. Mm. But um, if, if they're not paying you for that investment, then you're already losing money on this job. Uh, so... If you can get good sound, that's all they really care about in the end. And uh, if you can convince them that you can do that with uh, with just your boom mic and your little recorder, then then you're on your way. Um, and you know, if that's the case, then you can start using uh, whatever money you're making from this job to uh, maybe pay for some wireless gear. Right. But that being said, you don't have to spend you know. Five thousand dollars on wireless gear, either. Uh, Sennheiser, the uh, the G4 series are a very good bang for your buck, and those are not, as, you know, they're they're not cheap, but they're not super expensive either. Um, I do find that when you get into the low end of inexpensive wireless, mm -hmm. the quality drop off is very steep. Um, mm -hmm. You, you have a tiny little battery powered box that's you know trying to interpret audio and transmit it through a little radio transmitter and the, the cheaper smaller electronics become noisy and um, they're very they're, they're much more prone to interference and static and uh, range issues and um, they break easier you know batteries don't last as long there's there's all kinds of reliability issues with the very cheap wireless. So if you're going to get into that arena, I would say, you know, start at the Sennheiser G4. And uh, if you're making money from this as a career, then, you know, save up your money and, and build from there later for some electrosonics or something. Right. It's not um, something necessarily to that you need to start off with, especially if you don't have the investment budget to do that, essentially. Right. Yeah. Um, but if you do, um, you know, like I said, buy good boom microphones first. Um, and, uh, and, and, and also, uh, you know, it's, it's not worth it to spend hundreds of dollars on, on an XLR cable when you can get away with spending $25 on one. Um, they might, they might break, a little quicker if you're using them every day and you know running around all over the place with you know different environments and stuff mm -hmm. but buy four of them and then you spent just as much as you did on the expensive one um, there, there's uh, 
I would argue with anyone that that a hundred dollar audio cable is not going to sound any better than than a twenty five dollar one. Um, and I've seen you know all kinds of stuff to back that up. So yeah, th those are the, that's what I would say as far as spending money. Awesome. Okay, that that sounds really good. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> uh, now switching gears a little bit. Yeah. Um, Whiplash. Whiplash is an incredible, an incredible movie that uh, I know I and and obviously many many people have enjoyed since its initial release. Uh, you acquired mm -hmm. multiple awards, including a BAFTA and an Oscar, alongside um, Ben Wilkins and Craig Mann, for your hard work on the film. And I'm sure you've had to answer many 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 questions about it the past like five to six years. Uh, but yeah. how about a quick couple more? <laughs> sure. Awesome. Um, now, I know that a lot of the actors, including Miles Teller, are actual musicians. Um, so how often were you really capturing music and instruments on set versus opting to be MOS? And what was the music playback workflow like on set? Um, th that was probably one of the most complex things about Whiplash. Um, Damien Chazelle, the writer and director, um, was very adamant about musical accuracy. That was um, something that he was uh, upset, well, obsessed is a strong word, but you know, <laughs> it, it was very important to his vision uh, for the film. And that's partially because this is an autobiographical mm -hmm. story. He he went through a lot of what you see on film, on you know film. Um, the uh, not just the main actors, but all of the background actors that were in the bands were all skilled musicians at the instrument that they were playing, mm -hmm. and they all received uh, the the sheet music of every song that they were going to play on camera ahead of time and they were expected to actually be able to play those instruments mm -hmm. um maybe not at the master level you know that they're portraying but good enough to be convincing on camera and um the the really interesting part about that is that we didn't record any of that on set mm -hmm. um we we did playback um for every full band scene and uh you know all of the main performances um and the reason for that is because the the environment that we were filming in the uh, the mise-en-scene of the of the shots was not something conducive to showing recording equipment you know like it, it doesn't make sense that you would have uh trumpets mic'd up in a in a classroom setting or in a uh you know uh, stage performance they, they just don't do that and so to record on set with any you know usable degree of quality we would have had to get every single instrument mic properly and you just can't do that and hide the microphones from the shot so we had no choice really in a practical sense to, but to do playback so um, Damien uh, something that we discussed in pre-production was that uh, he, he did want a microphone over the room when we were doing the playback and that was something that he learned from doing the short version of Whiplash which is how he got the funding to do the feature. Mm -hmm. um, they were hitting playback and then just hitting stop when they would you know when the playing stopped and he didn't like that it sounded just like a CD being played and then cut. And so when we had a live boom microphone over the, the instruments, when the actual song stops, you can still hear the, the performers uh, doing physical things like putting the drumsticks down or uh, you know messing with their valves and their horns mm -hmm. and stuff. And so it really lended a, a more realistic ambience to, to every shot that we did with playback. Um, another thing that that was uh, really crucial there is uh, Damien, even though this was a lower budget movie, he had the wherewithal to know that we needed a dedicated playback person on set. 
um, they had pre-recorded all of this music in the studio, and um, he chose to have recordings made with different time signatures and things. And so we we had a playback person on set that was working directly with Damien for each individual scene. They would change the actual song that was being played back to reflect like you know different time signatures and mistakes that were made and things like that. So that was all you know, pre-planned and something that, that he wanted to do ahead of time enough that he, you know, convinced the producers that it was worth paying for. And that, that that's the kind of thing that, that you don't hear about a lot in filmmaking is that, you know, just because he wanted something doesn't mean that he would necessarily get it. He had a fight for that because we only had, I think it was a three and a half million dollar budget. And, um, you know, that that kind of money goes real quick on a on a film production. <laughs> the uh, the workflow actually um, the, there's uh, the music video version of filming a uh, a playback scene would be that they put time code on the playback uh, recordings mm. and then they they play that back uh, and the camera sees the time code and then they just use that one file and hand it off to the editor, but that's not how we did it on Whiplash. Um, since each playback thing was different, we were afraid that that was going to get um, very confusing in post, so mm -hmm. I rolled on my production recording equipment every time that we did playback, and I recorded everything live as if it were a regular take. And, um, you know, so we just handed in everything like that, and... Uh, the editor knew that each shot was going to be a, a unique individual thing, just like every other regular take that we would do. So there was no confusion involved there. Mm -hmm. um, and um, oh, the uh, so the non-playback stuff we also had a lot of um, discussions about, and uh, the we kind of lucked out in a way because. Um, you can't uh, fake playing drums on camera. Like the, uh, we tried having they they, uh, they explored the option of using like fake cymbals. Um, you know, because you can't you can't hit a cymbal and have it not make any sound, and you can't not hit a cymbal and have it make a sound. So it has to be real on camera in order for it to look real and sound real. And um, so we knew that we that we just kind of had to go for it. And fortunately, mm -hmm. every scene where you actually see J.K. Simmons giving dialogue during the drumming, he's pretty much shouting at full strength. So uh, the the levels kind of worked out in our favor with that. Um, but every shot that you see during the drumming that there's dialogue and you don't see the drums, mm -hmm. then that wasn't happening on set, you know, it, it, we would obviously not have the drummer working off camera and, uh, you know, get those lines clean. And then they just edit that into the, the rest of the scene. So we made sure that we got everything clean during the playback or during the drumming sessions, uh, so that the editors could, you know, put everything in and it, and it wouldn't be affected by the, the, you know, noisy music. Right, absolutely, and I, I, I was thinking about that too because there are um, several times during the whole film, um, like the iconic rushing and dragging scene, where there are regular lines of dialogue sandwiched between J.K. Simmons yelling and loud percussion. So um, yeah. a novice mixer might um, have problems with peaking and distortion when given the sudden loud noises. So I was wondering yeah. how you made sure to cover the extreme differences clearly. Um, well, there's a couple of things to think about there. Uh, we were we were using a wireless boom mm -hmm. at that point, and we had to turn the gain down on the boom transmitter so that it wouldn't get overblown by the shouting. Yeah. Um, but then also I have a recorder that has a gain setting. And so when we were doing those scenes, I had to be watching uh, a live video feed and have, um, I, I would set my fader on my mixer to the, to the zero point 
which is, uh, you know, the normal place where it should be. And, um, and then I would be riding the, the gain knob. Um, so if he was talking softly, I would crank it, a, you know, as high as I needed to, to get that level knowing full well, you know, I had to focus and, and know the script and know the exact point when the actor was going to do it and basically be waiting for that to happen and sort of read what was going on in each individual shot and get ready to just jam that gain knob back down mm -hmm. to get the appropriate level for the shouting. And um, that's one of those things where it just takes focus and uh, knowing ahead of time, you know, what you're in for. So that's the kind of thing when rehearsals help and, you know, uh, obviously knowing your equipment and knowing the, the limits of what it can do and stuff like that. But it, it really came down to just focusing and, and being Johnny on the spot with the gain knob. And does uh, changing the gain like that while you are recording, does that, in your experience, prove difficult for any, like, uh, noise editing at, in post or anything like that? Does does changing that um, level... It, it changes the uh, the ambience. Right, which, exactly. Uh, which, which means that they would uh, likely have to put in some sort of room tone or, um, you know, smooth that out later on. Yeah. But um, it's, it's really the only option because otherwise it would be, uh, you know, horribly distorted and you would have to replace it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so with, with this talk about the planning and the rehearsals, I've heard that um, one of the most challenging parts of the entire process of making Whiplash was the quick time frame. So I was yeah. wondering how exactly you prepared in pre-production with the director or with the rest of the sound team, what steps you all took knowing that was the case. Sure. Um, and that's something that actually has been kind of unique in my career is that we had a whole lot of meetings in pre-production about sound specifically. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's not something that happens much in my experience. Um, you know, it's not uncommon to have a meeting about sound or a general production meeting where we raise, you know, whatever concerns we have. But mm -hmm. usually by that time, it's too late to really do a whole lot about it. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I made the point and Damien agreed that, um, you know, that we needed to get this stuff worked out ahead of time, not just between me and him, but with camera editing, you know, uh, the assistant directors were in on it, uh, because these were things that could affect our schedule. Yeah. Um, we had, uh, meetings with, uh, set decorators. Um, we actually had like a false wall built at one point, um, because, one of the sets that we, oh, uh, but there was a lot of challenges in this movie, and it wasn't just for sound. Um, one, one of the sets that was in the movie, the the jazz bar where Neiman uh, acquaints himself with Fletcher, um, that's not a real place. That was um, underneath the overhang of the um, theater where we were filming mm. most of the stage stuff. Mm. And so they literally built a false wall that was facing the sidewalk and the active street outside. <laughs> and I convinced, I convinced them to build a, a double wall there because that will deaden the sound of the traffic going by more. Um, and that was something that was worked out on a tech scout, um, which is something that sound mixers don't get to go on as well, uh, frequently. Um, but being able to go to the real places where we're actually going to be shooting ahead of time and getting a sense of what the problems that we're facing are would allowed us to spend money in pre-production to avoid spending more money and more hassle in post-production. And um, the fact that they were open to listening to me and, and you know, taking that advice seriously uh, paid off for them afterwards for sure. Pre yeah, I mean, if if you're on a shoot that has financial or time constraints, doing a, a lot of the work in, in pre-production and making a plan and then sticking to that plan is going to be 
you know, your, your most valuable time saver and your most valuable money saver, I think. Um, trying to fix things on the day when you already have a schedule that you're trying to keep is not um, going to help. It's going to make everybody nuts. You're going to do things wrong. You're going to spend more money than you need to. Um, and uh, so really that, that was the, the most valuable thing was, uh, you know, Damien had such a concrete vision. He already basically had the movie made in his head. And um, so he wasn't really uh, figuring things out or, um, you know, playing around with camera angles or anything. He already had every shot that he wanted to get in his head. And, you know, he, he was able to communicate all of this stuff brilliantly to everybody on set. And it really made for a very efficient and um, sort of, well, I wouldn't say problem-free because there's never a problem-free shoot. But, um, you know, they, they, they uh, alleviated all the big problems they could ahead of time. And that was really what made it possible. Yeah, awesome. And all the hard work obviously really shows. Even years yeah. and years later, I still love to hear about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but now thinking uh, more broadly again, um, mm. is there a scene or a setup from your entire career that you are most proud of and why? Well... <laughs> Certainly, uh, the uh, the rushing and dragging scene in, in Whiplash was one of them. Um, but I'm also very proud of my work on Yellowstone, which is a series on the Paramount Network. Mm. And um, we've had quite a bit of uh, complicated stuff on that show. Um, not just uh, like a lot of actors, but a lot of actors on horses and in vehicles and firing guns and fighting and, um, in the, you know, in, in the remote wilderness of, uh, Utah and Montana and all of the weather. And, um, you know, we, uh, we have consistently gotten three seasons of really good production audio there with almost no looping, and, um, you know, the, the amount of physical activity that the actors are involved in it, is uh, pretty daunting for getting good sound. And mm. so I, I've been really proud of that work. Yeah, yeah, recording outside can be quite dangerous when it comes to audio. It can be very troublesome. <laughs> I, I yeah. get that for sure. Yeah. But lastly, before we start wrapping up the questions, I just wanted to ask, do you have a favorite movie purely from a sound perspective? Sure. Um, I would say probably 2001. Oh. The, uh, the Stanley Kubrick film. Mm -hmm. um, it was ahead of its time in so many ways, not just with visual effects and, and uh, you know, futurology in general, but the way they use sound. Uh, I mean, Kubrick is, is brilliant in pretty much every facet of filmmaking. Um, but they used sound and the lack of sound so well in that movie. Um, it, it's just striking uh, every time I, I see it. Um, another one that is more academic, really, but um, the uh, Orson Welles um, movie and, geez, it just left me, and Citizen Kane. Oh, right? yes. Um, the greatest, the greatest movie ever made, Citizen Kane, um, was was really instrumental in changing the way that production sound was done. Um, they did all kinds of things that were not done then, uh, like using false ceilings to get uh, microphones closer to the actors, um, and uh, you know, basic A and B editing, and uh, all kinds of uh, techniques were invented by Orson Welles to, to actually enhance the, the sound of that film. And um, not a lot of people really know that, that side of it, but um, Citizen Kane really changed uh, the way movies were heard. Mm -hmm. And that, that's another one that's, that's uh, been instrumental in me, in my love of film sound. That's really interesting, especially with it being the the false ceilings you mentioned that early on and stuff like that. It's really interesting. 
Um, yeah, if you watch if you watch that movie, you'll see there's a lot of low angles where you see the ceilings yeah. all the time. And they used, uh, I think, um, bleached muslin was a, a mm -hmm. fabric they used for lighting a lot. But they stretched it over where the ceiling would be and had a, you know, and it, it appears solid on camera, but the sound passes through it so they could have a microphone a few feet away from the actors. That's, that's really cool. <laughs> that's a really yeah. cool tip. That's really interesting. Um, then tell us what's, what's next for you. Is there anything new and exciting on the horizon <laughs> looking for it? I know this isn't necessarily the prime time, but is there anything that we should be looking out for? Um, well, I do have uh, the last show that I worked on before all this uh, you know, quarantine business started. Uh, I did a show for Quibi, which is the, uh, oh. the new streaming service. Yeah. And I don't know exactly what date that it is supposed to premiere, but I, I did The Fugitive with uh, Kiefer Sutherland and Boyd Holbrook. And uh, that's a retelling of the, the movie, but it's a, it's a new version. Um, so, and it was uh, directed by the, the uh, guy who directed season one of 24, so oh, mm -hmm. there's, a lot of that, there's a lot of that vibe going on, and um, that was a really fun shoot. So um, I, think it's, I think it's scheduled to come out on June 4th on Quibi, mm -hmm. um, and I think there's 14 episodes. So, um, but in, you know, since uh, nobody's filming anything now, I don't have any <laughs> jobs coming up. I, I, was, uh, I was scheduled to start one uh, that was um, supposed to have like comedians and sports figures talking to each other, but as soon as everybody started getting sick, the sports figures disappeared. Yeah. And, uh, so we'll see what happens. I might get back to work in July. Mm -hmm. um, but there's nothing solid at the moment. I'm just sort of keeping my ear to the to the news and uh, yeah. trying to see if any opportunities pop up, and I'll I'll jump on them as soon as they start opening production offices again. Yeah, I, I'm sure a lot of the industry <laughs> feels the same. But until yeah. then, we'll check out Quibi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, stay safe and use this time wisely. You know, I mean, a lot of people are writing, and um, you know, if you've got that kind of thing that you've always wanted to do, then use this time and make it happen. Yeah, I absolutely agree. As long as you're healthy, yeah. <laughs> um, but, well, thank you. Uh, that's all I, I have prepared for our interview. So thank you so much sure. for spending time today and sitting down and joining me. Uh, I, yeah, it's my pleasure. Yeah, I, I learned a lot. It was really awesome to discuss with you. So thank you. For sure.